<laughs> Hello, Adam. How are you doing? Okay. I'm doing great, Manan. How are you? <laughs> Not too bad. Not too bad. Adam, uh, why don't you tell us about uh, your journey so far? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for having me on the podcast. You know, it's fun to talk to you regardless, but, you know, <laughs> certainly great to let others in on our conversations. Uh, I think as you may or may not share with your with your listening audience, I run uh, operations for a firm called Bring Ruckus. We specialize in growth and performance marketing searches, typically at the director level and above um, leveling in the U.S. markets uh, and primarily work with Series A through Series D fast growing startups, a lot of which are on the uh, direct to consumer side of things. Perfect. And is uh, is is your team co-located? Uh, how, how is your team uh, structured? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say what's unique in my experience in my career uh, with Bring Ruckus as opposed to previous stops on my journey is that we don't have a physical office. We're actually pretty geographically distributed. Uh, we have a number of team members in Argentina, in Scotland, in Mexico, in Colombia, and in the U.S. as well now. So we're uh, and coast to coast in the U.S. So we're we're very much covering you know a number of time zones, and uh, it brings a really great vibe to our team. No, yeah, that's fantastic, and that's that's actually quite like us. I mean, I think all of us uh, work in India, uh, but uh, again, no office. Um, everybody is uh, working from home, um, and it. You know, we are in the midst of a massive uh, debate right now, right? Uh, remote, kind of a hybrid versus, you know, uh, co-located in an office uh, kind of a model. And you, with Bring Ruckus, you've been working remotely. Um, and uh, earlier, I think you were co-located in an office. Uh, how were your, you know, uh, how was your work situation like earlier? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think... I think with the recruiting space and staffing in general, there's there's a lot of external communication. Uh, there's a lot of conversations going on, and it can be often really challenging to be in an office space and going through that. I remember uh, a previous firm I worked with, Bring Ruckus, um, you know, isn't my first rodeo in the search space, but I remember, and this pr was pre pre global pandemic, but we actually were looking at. Um, like these little cubicles to put in our office that were mm -hmm. soundproof so that we could have recruiters stagnate um, and mix around where they were taking calls. Because oftentimes it would be just too overwhelming to, to have everyone on, uh, you know, phone screens or interviews or discussions with VCs and clients at the same time uh, that I almost feel like the, the remote space has, has worked out really well for this industry. Perfect. And has in your experience, like, does it, does it hamper, uh, you know, being remote, does it hamper the learning curve for rookie recruiters? I think it depends on the onboarding plan. Uh, you know, if somebody is coming on board, depending on the leveling, uh, you know, it, it can be a challenge. And I think part of that when, you know, when we address hiring internally at Bring Ruckus, we really look at uh, what type of experience somebody has. In some cases, as I'm sure you and the audience are well familiar with, uh, recruiters don't often come from recruiting. Not many people go into this space or go into school and say, I want to be a recruiter when I grow up. Yeah. And so as a result, you get really varied and mixed backgrounds. And um, what I've found is that training and onboarding becomes so critical in that sense, in terms of how engaged everyone is and how you plan calls. It's not as easy to sit next to somebody and say, oh, well, why'd you say that on this meeting? But with tools like Zoom and Google Meet and, you know, other video calls and, and Slack, you can certainly listen in and, and give feedback. So it's really how you make the most of the tools that are available to you and, and having somebody that's really proactive with their curiosity. Right. Yeah. And so ever since we went remote, one of, one of uh, the learnings that we've had is being very proactive and kind of over communicate uh, with your team. Uh, but you minimize the loss of information 
you know, when you are communicating over a Zoom call like, like this one, right? So uh, of course, in person, the communication is different and this one is different. And uh, one of the ways that we have coped with it is inculcate a culture of over communication and especially uh, written communication, right? So if you compel yourself to write, that means that you are compelling everybody to be more articulate with their thoughts and help explain uh, you know that thought process better uh, to uh, uh, to the other person so that's one of the things that we've seen helped us uh, you know transition uh, towards a, a completely um, you know remote team now changing gears a little bit uh, uh, so Adam is a director of operations at Bring Ruckus, which is a super fast growing, super fun, um, you know, search firm uh, a, uh, focused mainly on tech industry. Uh, so Adam, uh, what, what does director of operations do? Um, so give us a, a, you know, a picture uh, of what, what does a typical day look like? Yeah, it's a really good question. The answer that I like to give as like the simplest explanation is everything that doesn't involve recruiting and, you know, sourcing and research. Um, and that can be kind of a cop out statement. But, <laughs> but I think where I've found my niche in the search space, having not come from this space originally, is, is looking at this as a business and, and looking at the, the customer experience lens, meaning both the candidate and the client customer experience, and figuring out everything from the tech stack that's used to the processes and workflow that are established to make sure that our firm is firing on all cylinders and delivering the expectations that our clients deserve, you know, transparently at the, at the fee rates that they're paying, um, you know many people will hire themselves and, and more power to them, but there's a reason why they choose search firms like Bring Ruckus to, to enlist their services. And we want to make sure that when they do, that that experience is exceptional. Right. Okay. So um, yeah. What does a typical day look like uh, for you then? Well, it's usually like noontime, Indian whiskey with my friend Manan <laughs> and product updates. And yeah, it's, it's easy, right? No, I think uh, there isn't a typical day. And I know that's a cliche answer. Um, a lot of what I do is a combination of, um, I call it like my air traffic control pilot view. Mm -hmm. So whether that's utilizing a tool like Recruiter Flow and, and checking in on each of our recruiters and search teams, on the state of all of our active searches. I'm also working closely with our CEO to see what business is in development. Uh, I look closely at bandwidth to make sure that we're allocating resources appropriately. Um, I'm working on training and development and recruiting for recruiters internally, working on streamlining process or to your earlier point, if there's documentation that's missing about how we do things, it is really critical to have written communication so that everyone's on the same page and not assuming that somebody on the team might know something and others don't. Yeah. Um, but I'm also involved, you know, I touch everything from our perks and benefits programs to, to our hiring and forecasting and how we structure the team and incentives. Um, and also working on building out different processes to make sure that we, you know, we scale successfully. Sure. Yeah. I mean, traditionally, um, it, we've seen, at least I've seen this kind of a role given to uh, the title given to it, like chief of staff, right? So mm -hmm. those chief of staff uh, who, who makes, you know, makes sure that, you know, all the pieces are in place uh, so that, uh, you know, this, this, so that CEO's time and office is used for the most optimal uh, outcomes, right? So, uh, absolutely. Yeah. That, that, so, and I have seen, uh, you know, this kind of a role, uh, getting more and more traction in the world of, uh, executive search, right? So, uh, apart from bring ruckus, we work with a few other firms where they have, you know, either operations manager, director of operations, but somebody who's not involved in recruiting or in sales or anything at all. They just, you know, uh, manage operations. Um, 
However, you know, recruiting or search business is a bit of a hierarchical business. It has been, uh, it has, it has had a certain kind of a hierarchy for a really long time, kind of a partner-driven uh, scaling. Uh, how in, in that kind of a structure, where do you see, you know, operations kind of a role fit in, you know, uh, over the next five years? You know, I, I continue to see this role evolve and I've seen other firms that have brought on um, others like me to, to sort of figure out how to drive the business side of things. Um, and in some cases I'll see, and I think you and I have talked about this before, um, in some cases there'll be an individual that's brought on to run like recruiting operations, but that person might be more heavily involved on like reviewing quality of candidates or, um, or a bit more granular details as it relates to a given search. Yeah. I, don't, I don't see myself or, or necessarily this form of an operations role as mm-hmm. much so in the weeds and more so looking at how, do I, how am I enabling success for the rest of the firm? So for example, if that's our CEO, or if that's the CEO of a or leadership team of a, a search firm, it's how do I make sure that this individual is able to uh, drive business growth and have the conversations that they need to have to grow the brand, to, to, to bring in great inbound leads, to, to potentially work on strategic outbound, uh, and how are we protecting their time? When I, In the previous firm I worked with, we called this protecting the queen. <laughs> with Bring Ruckus, I call it a little bit about protecting the king, but it's really important to protect that time. And then on the on the tactical side of things with recruiters and our associates or sourcers, what I look at is how do I help make their jobs easier? So if that means reducing the number of clicks for a task or reducing manual data entry or streamlining their visibility and enabling visibility into the history of a candidate that makes them have a more thoughtful and personalized experience, then that's what I'm going to be pushing for. Sure. That's, yeah, I mean, um, and at a certain stage, right, this becomes very, very important. And uh, what I've seen uh, is with recruiting firms that most of the firms fail to, you know, I, our data suggests more than 80% of the firms fail to scale beyond 10 recruiters. And mm. uh, the main reason is that there is, there is nobody, uh, you know, who, who is, whose sole job is to help everybody do better, right? So, and in fact, if you see uh, traditional sales organizations, inside sales organizations, there is, uh, you know, now we since last few years we've seen a role of sales enablement mm-hmm. organization inside as a part of the sales organization whose job is just this, right? So running sales ops, they are not doing the sales; they are just making sure that every person in the sales team is operating at that hundred percent. And I think one of the challenges with that, you know, sales enablement or sales ops role or, or biz ops role in a search firm is, and I've had this discussion with our CEO, it is really difficult to quantify that value yeah. that that individual or individuals has on the business. You know, to some degree, you could, you could speculate and say, if we didn't have this, this function, would we be able to scale or grow, you know, 60%, 70% year over year, but it's really hard to actually nail that down and what that looks like. And that's a challenge when you look at in a sales organization or a recruiting organization, it's very much tied to, uh, for the most part, like a search number. So, okay, yes, if this person wasn't here, we wouldn't have hit X revenue dollars and have been able to grow, which makes it, you know, very black and white. On the, on the value that's provided there. So that, that's an interesting piece to look at as well as, as firm scale and as this function takes off a bit more. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Um, and so while we are talking about scaling, you, you worked uh, across different spectrums um, uh, of uh, company sizes, right? So can you, can you give us an idea about how, the operations and challenges are different at, you know, let's say a five recruiters firm 
a firm like Bring Ruckers, which is I think about 15 recruiters, or a firm like maybe let's say Swing, which is about you know I think about 40 recruiters. I can be off on numbers, but uh, generally want to talk about um, the main differences in operations and uh, challenges uh, at each stage. Yeah, you know it's it, it's interesting to me. I think one of the things I've noticed, and this might be true outside of the staffing space or recruiting space as well is early on when you're a handful of people, you might externally mention your team um, and, and the idea of we, but essentially it's, it's all hands on deck. The, the CEO or founder is often very hands-on out of necessity to really drive the business, drive, drive pretty much everything as it relates to a business, whether it's the contract piece, the assigning of searches, the, the, um, you know, owning of client relationships. And then I think where the magic happens is when you gradually, as I said earlier, protect the king or protect the queen, and you now have a team that you trust, that you know can deliver the same experience that you envision driving, you know, whether it's one search or 50 searches at a time uh, to success. And so uh, what's really fun about growing from, you know, the five person shop to, uh, to 15, 20 and, and going into double digit millions in revenue is, is crafting that team with the, and I'm sure you see this with recruiter flow too, with your own business in a startup is, is figuring out how to capture the magic that is your culture with one or two people that stay up late and drink great whiskey to the people <laughs> that are now when there's more people than we're there to start with. Yeah. Um, when you look around a room and, and even outside staffing, I remember being in a firm where I think I was employee 170 or something around there. And then seeing when we had 300 employees or 800 employees and realizing this isn't a shared experience. These are now, there's more people that have just started than we're here for this journey. And so I think part of it is protecting the culture, protecting each, going back to the customer experience piece, protecting each each facet of the experience that your clients or customers um, or candidates are experiencing throughout that journey so that you, you keep that identity and what's most important, which ultimately comes down to people. And that also is what's really cool about staffing is at the end of the day, this is all people and moving people. Yeah, no, that's, you, you know, this, this business is extremely, extremely people driven. And one of the hardest problems to solve uh, is finding the right people, uh, you know, for your recruiting team, right? So you've had experience scaling teams. Um, if if you were to advise, uh, you know, a, you know, a CEO of maybe let's say a one year old recruiting firm who's looking to kind of double up uh, uh, his or her size in next one year. How would you advise them uh, to go about hiring, uh, you know, recruiters for their team? It's a good question. I think first and foremost, what is the end goal? Um, and some people might not be comfortable speaking about that. Others are more outwardly confident and share, you know, my goal is to sell this business upon X, Y, and Z happening, or. I would like to see us grow to X, Y, and Z. And so part of my job on the operations side is, okay, let's figure out how to get you there. Um, so whether that's assessing average contract size and doing the math about, well, if we bring in this number of recruiters and we assign you know, a quota or something to that individual and, and figuring out, okay, this is how much business we have to generate to hit these goals. Um, it might not be as granular. And in many cases, when there's a great recruiter and they're doing this on their own and maybe just sort of testing the waters, the first question I ask is, why do you want to hire anybody else? Why don't you want to just do this yourself? Because the reality is the margins are fantastic. If you do a good job, you can make a lot of money in this space. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's why there's a lot of people that hang their shingle and say, yes, I'm a recruiter. Um, do I think there's as much value in the network anymore? Probably not. Do I think there's value in personalization in those relationships? Yes. Um, but I, I always come back to what is the end goal? If you're, if you're looking for, you know, a challenge of growing a team and growing a business, then you want to think strategically about how, who you bring on next. 
if you want a very easy pace of life yeah um and try to reduce the stress take on a few searches yourself and see if you can do it and realize that there's there's uh, a little bit of magic to this space if you figure it out um so it comes down to what those drivers are i think sure so uh but in terms of you know so let's say you you are interviewing a recruiter right so mm-hmm. what kind of traits would you look for um you know in that in that recruiter let's say your 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 target is that okay this person brings in x amount of you know uh, billing and revenue um and help help the firm get from a to b right so um how would you you know what in your opinion in your experience what are the defining traits of a great recruiter and how to They've find to have the yeah so <laughs> finding them is really hard yeah. uh, for those listening who are recruiters it is very much your market more power to you uh the conversation and the landscape has greatly changed in the last several months from yes i'd love to speak more and learn about your opportunity to just flat out asking me you know if the person who asked me or persons who have asked me tell me what the comp is like good for you that's that's great that you're at that point but ultimately yeah. i i look at the same thing that we look at with the clients that were with the candidates that we're looking to place at client businesses is have you do you have some type of a track record are you you know the prover- proverbial person that rolls up your sleeves um do I think that it's healthy at this point to be working like 80 hours a week? No. Um, but I think you can work smarter, not harder. And part of that is the tools that you implement and the the process that you implement. Um, and I think what I've noticed is less and less of, uh, in my opinion, less of a focus on what, ty- like if you've recruited before, what types of roles you've worked on and more so Like, how are you going to resonate with our clients? Are you somebody who's going to build trust within the first conversation or are our clients going to constantly go back and say, no, I want to speak to, you know, bring me to your leader kind of a thing. Like I want to talk to them. They're going to have the answers. Or are you the one that they say, the client says, "Uh, I trust you. You're going to help me make the right decision. And the candidate says, I want you to be my, you know, my career Sherpa and take me along the way. And, and I think that's so important. If you're somebody who can build your brand, if you're somebody who just has that gravitational pull on people, you're going to be a great asset anywhere as a recruiter. Um, But you got to have that hustle and, and just, you know, I think people in this space get a really bad rap, but those who do it well, are really knowledgeable about the person in the seat that they're filling. Absolutely. Absolutely. The bad rap is, uh, it's true. And I mean, you you just do one search of recruiters on Reddit and it will tell you the kind of (laughs) um, that our our space has. But I think that that, that's, that's driven by probably, you know, 20, 25% of, um, I don't want to say bad apples, but it's just, you know, people who just haven't had enough experience um, and them making mistakes uh, and learning their steps. Right. So, uh, and probably a few bad apples. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, I, 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 but I, I see that right with a lot of uh, recruiter flow customers, right. So they've been able to build relationships and build not just relationships, but understanding of people and the space that they operate in that for them recruiting and, you know, getting, you know, I don't know, $500,000, $600,000 in uh, billings in a year is practically like picnic, right? Like it's, it's not even work for them. They make a few calls, do a few things and, you know, uh, have whiskey at 12 PM in the afternoon. And, uh, they are done. So, uh, and you can get, uh, one of the things that I've also seen is uh, that this is not an easy space. Like you can, you know, it, 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 it takes a lot of hard work uh, and a lot of smart work as well. So 
have you in your experience have you seen um, you know people burning out uh, or have you experienced that yourself how have you dealt with it or have you how have you seen others dealing with that i think there's definite burnout and i think that's why you see a lot of i think back and forth to some degree with recruiters jumping between in-house opportunities and agency side or running they're trying to give it a go at their own their own firm just by doing the math and saying, Hey, I think I could do this on my own. Um, and, and I think it's a challenge. And I think part of it, you know, when I, when I interview prospective recruiters to join us at bring ruckus, which we are very much, you know, trying to scale and find great people to join us. Um, how's that for a little plug, (laughs) but, but what I would say is, you know, one of the things I look at is people who are excited about the challenge of, of, getting to work with different clients. I think, you know, one of the things I hear consistently from in-house recruiters is I've hired like 250 people this year and I'm just, I'm fried and I've worked on the same roles and it's all internal. So it's the same business. Uh, Maybe it's going through a lot more inbound um, to review. And on the agency side, you know, for us, we work with a wide variety of clients. Granted, historically, we've still worked in a pretty niche space and starting to expand beyond that, but it makes it a little bit more exciting. And each search is like, okay, let's, you know, let's shake it off and let's, let's see, learn about a new business. And I think that intellectual or inherent curiosity really serves recruiters well, because they get to dive into a new company, a new mission, um, And I think when we talk about remote versus hybrid versus in office, I think one of the challenges that they now are seeing is how do you really, how do you really soak in what that company's culture is like um, beyond just the tactical, like, okay, what's your, what's your budget been? Have you had any direct reports? Um, I think we're getting to a point where we need to get back to understanding like what those drivers are beyond just, okay, here's the metrics and checkpoints that you check off. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. No. And uh, yeah, I hiring, uh, uh, you know, at this stage, the way uh, we look at it, uh, hiring recruiters, uh, hiring in pretty much any sector is extremely, extremely challenging uh, right now. Um, so in, in, a, in an environment, I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball now. So in an environment like sure. what we see ourselves in today, let's say, I, let's say I'm, I'm um, you know, a CEO of a small recruiting firm. We do about a million dollars in revenue, small team, four people. I want to get to two, two and a half million dollars in revenue in next one, one and a half years. And... You are the man to chalk me up a plan. How would you uh, go about it? And if if you had to give me only three, um, you know, pieces of advice, uh, what would that be? Closer searches. I would first find out what your longest open search is. See mm-hmm. how long it's been going on. What your success rate is on filling searches. Um, your average contract value and getting a sense of the personnel that you have on your team, what they're doing in terms of their, you know, book of business and their success rates, whether that's time to fill the quality of the candidates that they're they're submitting. Um, And, you know, depending on the types of roles that you're working on, better understand your network and, and how you've had success bringing on those clients to figure out how to replicate that. Okay. All right. Uh, Ah, that's a lot to a lot to digest, right? So, in and this is this is actually quite akin to how uh, we we think about scaling SaaS firms like like us, right? So, uh, we look at pretty much the same matrix, right? So we look at ACV, we look at the sales cycle. Uh, ACV is you know average contract value. Um, yeah. In your in 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 search business, you know, uh, time to fill in in uh, traditional software SaaS business, it's uh, average sales cycles. So how much time does mm-hmm. it take uh, for you to uh, close that average customer? Um, and uh, we would look at uh, productivity of uh, the sales team, right? So for every dollar that you spend on the sales team, uh, in fact, sales and marketing team, uh, how much are you able to bring in? 
every quarter, right? So yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, try and scale from there, understanding that some of these metrics are going to be different as you scale, right? So, uh, so for example, if if spending hundred dollars uh, gets you, uh, you know. Hundred and let's it gets it's going to get you two hundred dollars in revenue. Uh, doesn't mean that you know spending two hundred dollars is going to get you four hundred dollars, but it's going to probably get you three fifty dollars in revenue because the marginal efficiency of each additional spent dollar decreases, and you kind of uh, uh, get to projections in terms of you know uh, how you would want to scale this. And uh, again. Hiring uh, is the challenging part uh, of that scaling, and uh, why don't I also plug you, right? So if anybody, if 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 anybody who's listening to this and you are a recruiter or want to dabble into recruiting, Adam is the man you should be talking to. I, I will put a link uh, to bring Rekus's website uh, in the description. Um, okay, so sounds good. <laughs> yeah, and I would just and I would just add to that. Not necessarily on the hiring front, but what I would say when you're talking about scaling and your goals, kind of like what we dive into in this space with our clients or respective clients, what's the value proposition? What what makes you different from your competitors out there? And how do you embrace that so that you can grow? Like for us at Bring Ruckus, we, we really pride ourselves on being a little bit different. And I think the irony there, when you think about, you know, the word ruckus and yeah. Part of our goal is to really reduce ruckus for our clients. Yeah. Um, so something to think about in terms of an oxymoron, if you will. But ultimately, it's it's what's your value proposition? What what has worked really well for you, and why are you different from all these other staffing firms out there, or recruiting firms, or in-house teams? That's going to allow you to generate that success and make sure it's not just a flash in the pan. Yeah, absolutely. And but it's it's it's. It's not easy, right? So especially in a service uh, space, right? Especially in uh, executive search or a staffing business. How would you, okay, so, uh, okay, I'm your friend. I'm going to believe you. Yes, bring records is different. But if I were not your friend, how would you convince me about, you know, BR being, being different from maybe 20 other firms out there? Go to one of our events. Okay. Uh, I, 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 uh, Grace from Bring Ruckus uh, uh, sends me invites to a whole lot of them. I'll probably attend one of those. <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah, too you know, far away from I, the D2C space. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and I think we, you know, we just started to do some in-person events as well. We're doing one in Buenos Aires in Argentina. We just did one in New York City this week. Yeah. And I think, you know, just having a casual environment for for these really fascinating startup leaders and, and growth individuals to, to not necessarily feel the pressure of an interview, but just to sort of nerd out on what they're passionate about yeah. um, has proven to be a really great space. We, you know, bring ruckus. I think one of the things that uh, is a differentiator for us is we very much focus on karma and we try not to, to work with people that are not going to, um, necessarily align with that mindset or mentality of just doing the right thing and working with great people, whether that's clients, candidates, like we talked about earlier, it comes back down to people. Um, and it's part of how we look at hiring. I know you said hiring for recruiters is hard. The, the skill set and the chops is really hard, but just being a good human being and having somebody, not saying there aren't good human beings out there, but but finding somebody that's going to embrace, uh, embrace your, you know, what you're working on and, and who you are collectively as a, as a unit to try to drive that scale. It's, it's challenging. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. And so I was, I think last, last week or uh, the week before that, I'm not sure. Um, I was talking to uh, a customer of Recruiter Flow and also a great guy, uh, Tris Revel, who, who runs uh, this firm called Growth Hacking Recruiters, which is also uh, a Facebook group. Um, and we were talking about challenges of hiring. And my biggest challenge uh, in terms of hiring is it's it's not that difficult to 
uh, you know, uh, to measure for skills, right? So communication skills, technical skills, um, or anything like that. But it's extremely difficult to measure for empathy, and mm. and at, at recruiter flow, right? So we we uh, we've built uh, the product, uh, and I like to also think the culture on on you know on empathy as our you know foundational stone right so it, it's because empathy uh, towards customers towards other people that you work with drives good outcomes for everybody right so if we look at product we look at um customer success or customer support we look at sales at every stage if you are able to empathize with with the customer that you are talking to, 50% of the problem is solved right there. And it's not an easy thing to scale, right? And uh, uh, I, I like to think that we've, we've do, done an okay job at it, at least until now, we are still a very small team, uh, but we are growing, you know, our, we are growing three, 3.5 3 X every year. Uh, and my challenge as I look at, you know, end of 2022, how am I going to scale, uh, you know, empathy uh, in, in our hiring process? And uh, if anybody who's listening has some good ideas, I'm all ears. Um, yeah, it's not easy to search for that in LinkedIn Recruiter or with Williams. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, I, I've, it's not for lack of trying, but it's hard to find empathy. You're right. Yeah, yeah we are. Uh, and it's, it's, I think it's the most if I had to define like the single most important thing that we look for is empathy, right? So if you, if, if you have empathy, it'll solve a lot of problems, um, at least in a culture like us. Um, so, uh, uh, so yeah. Um, so to give uh, our listeners a little bit of an idea, Bring Ruckus and Adam um, have been uh, Recruiter Flow users. Um, Adam, I want to understand how uh, you use Recruiter Flow uh, at bring at bring ruckus, uh, what kind of uh, you know, uh, what kind of value have you driven out of it? Yeah, you know, a, as an operator, I've had the opportunity. I would say the it's like a double edged sword with having the opportunity to explore a wide array of options as it relates to the um, the ATS space, or I call it, I continuously call it the hybrid ATS CRM. Yeah. So just a whole bunch of acronyms and letters and together. <laughs> they probably spell recruiter flow at this point, um, even to the point of, you know, jerry rigging some different other tools to try to make them work. Uh, for me, one of the things I've learned shadowing recruiters um, at different firms and, and understanding workflow and everything is the data entry piece needs to be so simple. It doesn't need to be a Salesforce level experience. It just needs to get the job done. Um, and I would say the biggest difference for us that I look at is when I look at a tool like LinkedIn Recruiter or AngelList or some of these other platforms, I look at that as like the cold source of truth or the cold outreach. And when I look at Recruiter Flow, I call it our warm sourcing tool. And I, I think that that's an ongoing push that's that's been a struggle for me uh, to be able to to build that adoption. I think like with any tool, it's it's still getting to to the point of having users get to the point of of really using this as a single source of truth. And it's something that um, you know we we constantly work on. But I think when I look at any type of database or platform, the the issue that you often run into is bad data in is bad data out is bad data in. Yes. So part of it is data governance and part of it is figuring out how to get the most value and have the fewest number of clicks. And so for us, how we use it, myself as an operator, I love to look at the jobs view of recruiter flow and I love the Kanban functionality to be able to, at any given point in time, look at real time where our searches are, where candidates that are actively in process are moving where they're not, where I need to step in and look at potential red flags, where we could do a better job, where we have over or under communicated. 
Um, from a business development side of things, it gives our team insight into what potential business will work on and just a really clean way of looking at people that we've had two-way engagement with. Yeah, no, you're right. And um, it is very easy to drive adoption in a, in a, in a, in a small setting, but once you cross you know, eight, 10 uh, people uh, kind of a mark, um, the biggest challenge is driving adoption. And that's why just sales, so there, is, there is a multi-billion dollar, dollar industry of just the tools that help people to data entry into Salesforce. I mean, you know, so you can probably, because Salesforce experience for, for day-to-day, uh, you know, for sales uh, representatives is not the best, uh, but it's, it's a great, great tool for you know VP sales, right? So uh, uh, and the, there is a you know a billion dollar industry of uh, just uh, uh, Chrome extensions and uh, Gmail plugins and uh, all these sorts of different things just to help people put data into Salesforce. So um, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, what would you say is your favorite feature of Recruiter Flow then? The next one, <laughs> <laughs> I, and I say that you know partially joking for the zinger, but I also say it because uh, what I've, what I've enjoyed about our working relationship and personal relationship is you're so, when you talk about empathy, you're very, as a leader of your organization, are very open to feedback and understanding what's going to make your customers experience, which in turn makes their customers experience that much more impactful using your, your system. And it's been so enjoyable to be able to go through feedback, whether it's coherent or run on sentences that I email you in the frantically in the middle of the night, or just, hey, what if uh, type of scenarios, that's been really fun to watch the evolution of your business and how each little adjustment has made our jobs easier. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we thrive on that, right? So uh, uh, we've been able to get a recruiter flow right mostly because of customer feedback, right? So, and um, again, it, it all comes back to empathy that, you know, if, if you are, if you have empathy, you would try and put yourself in your customer's shoes and say, hmm, how about that, right? That question is, is very important. Um, and um, yeah, that's, 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 you know, the best answer that I've heard to this question in my limited experience of recording maybe what 10 podcasts or something like that <laughs> <laughs> well you know i think you have a very you know there's empathy but there's also a thick skin and i think with all the questions that i throw at you i don't think there's ever been uh you know uh even i would say you're unwavering in your your drive for wanting to 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 help us achieve what we're trying to achieve. And it could be the Amrit talking, but I, but I do, you know, I genuinely believe that. I think you're, you're in business for the right reasons and to, to really help make this a successful product and not waiting, you know, a quarter or two quarters down the road to challenge yourself and your team to get that done. Yeah, no, I'll drink to that. Cheers. <laughs> yeah, cheers. Uh, all right, so... Adam, you, you've had a, a pretty long career in recruiting, outside of recruiting. Um, to close out, I want to ask you uh, about you know, one person, one book, one podcast, anything, anything at all that has had an outsized impact on how you look at the world. Mm, that's tough. Uh... The biggest impact has probably been from my wife, but if you want to go like the podcast route, which, <laughs> which is fine, uh, I would say there's a podcast called How I Built This, and I think it's run by Guy Raz. Uh, and what I enjoy about it is, I think to the best of the ability with these podcasts, is really dives into the backstory of how founders go about their journey um, in some unsuspecting ways. Even hearing about guys like, um, the founder of, um, there's like a bread company okay. and what this guy went through from going to like going down the path of drug use and prison and losing a kid to, to then figuring out like 
the path to success in this business and, and realizing like it was okay to go into a family business and here's how they did it and here's how they scaled. It's, it's fascinating to hear directly those stories. Um, you know, having also been a startup founder myself um, and one that, you know, doesn't end up, you know, yes, we're on Crunchbase saying we were acquired, which peripherally looks great. But, you know, we're not the ones in TechCrunch getting the big headlines saying, you know, multi-millions of dollars invested or buyout. And now they're on the Forbes, you know, wealthiest people list. Yeah. The reality is there are a number of different startups that you never see make it to, the, to that point. And so I think hearing the perspective of, you know, it isn't just, you know, finding a VC that's passionate about what you're doing and cutting you a check. It's really about... Um, you know, that drive mentality and, and having the willingness to try to try to see what you do after failure. That's really exciting. Yeah, no, you are absolutely right. And I don't know, I, I, I have the worst ability to remember who, who said those quotes or ex actually exactly remember those quotes, but uh, it, it went something like this, right? Like the test of a character is not how hard you can punch, but it's, uh, how you get up after taking a punch or, or something like that. It's, I'm, I'm really bad at it, but it, it, the, the quote, if it, if it all comes back, if it all comes back to Bill Murray, you're okay. Just say, <laughs> so I got that going for me. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I it's, uh, um, it's kind of like that. And uh, I, I, I also like to hear uh, stories. I, I, I regularly listen to, uh, uh, to masters of scale in which you know oh yeah of, with reed hoffman yeah great yeah with reed hoffman and a lot of people they actually talk about their real stories and um i've had so i i i've had both my parents you know i've had a, i don't know the privilege uh, of looking at both my parents uh from a very young age uh when i was i think six is when my father launched his business and I was 10 or something like that. My mother launched her business. Both of them, you know, uh, stumbling, succeeding, failing, and eventually scaling um, their, their, you know, businesses to a point where, you know, they are, they are extremely happy. Uh, and, uh, uh, and my mother, in fact, has been a constant source of inspiration for me, right? And I've seen her work and she, she is... Um, you know, again, and one thing that I've seen her do her job really, really well is again, empathy, right? She's the one thing that she does very well is listen, understand she's, she's a financial advisor. So her whole thing is, okay, how do I help you achieve your financial goals and, uh, uh, manage your money? Right. So, uh, um, that's a, that's an interesting point you bring up, um, you know, as the as the kid of, of entrepreneurs. And I wonder about that for my own kids. Um, you know, I think you and I have talked about how my my wife and I have a startup as well in the bakery yeah. business. Yeah, uh, she is. She is by far the most empathetic person I know. She's only trying to think about others before herself. Um, but I wonder what that impact will be like on our kids to see you know, mom and dad didn't go to an office and work for somebody else for the most part. It's, you know, they're carving out what they're trying to do. And I wonder if that's going to have a similar type of impact. Like for you, did you ever feel swayed from taking that risk because you had seen that was just inherently what you saw with your parents that they took a risk? Or did you feel, yes, I want to go back to, you know, I want to make sure that I'm in something that's very secure. So I don't have to experience those ups and downs that an entrepreneur faces? No, I think um, it was uh, ever since I went to university, it was pretty much, I, I knew that I, I'm, I, I'm, I probably would take a job here and there, but for the most part, I'm going to be running a business just like my parents did. Um, and in fact, af after university at the end of first year, I, it took me 16 months to start my first business after uh, university. And at, at the end of 11th, 12th month, my mom was kind of questioning, you know, uh, what are you doing? Like you, 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 you did that for one year, you had your salary, you had your fun, you know, uh, do you want to make something of your life or not? And, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, 
um, so I kind of come up, come from that kind of a background, and uh, I think it's it, it's unique, and uh, it really, especially because when when going got tough, uh, my mom was the rock, right? Uh, she kept on pushing that you know there is there is always you you know half of the game in the in you know running a business is just persistence, like just keep at it, keep doing the right thing. And, you know, you will reach the right destination. So um, I'm sure your kid is learning something from that. Yeah. What I'm, what I'm getting to is cutting through all between the lines is <laughs> help me forecast, you know, 13, 14 years from now, what are my kids going to be saying about this experience of, uh, of what it's like experiencing what mom and dad do? Um, yeah. You know, it's so curious to wonder how this will affect them. Well, only time will tell. But if if I am at education, um, they would also be, you know, having conversation like uh, I am having right now, uh, 14, 15 years down the road, hopefully of a multi-billion dollar giant. There we go. <laughs> well, perfect. Adam, you've been an absolute delight. This is one of the easiest conversations that I've had. Uh, thank you so much. I will put the link uh, of Bring Ruckus and uh, uh, you know Adam's LinkedIn profile in the description. If you want to find Adam, uh, hit him up. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Manon. It's been a pleasure. No, my pleasure. Thanks, Adam.